We're going to start by looking at some of the basic facts of this case. We're going to look at where the incident took place, and we're also going to look at some of the initial witnesses to what occurred. We're going to consider the geography of the incident, where specifically the shooting occurred, and why the location was significant. And then we're going to consider some of the initial areas of evidence around the timing of what took place. And this will lead us on to some more detailed considerations around the evidence in later videos. So starting with the very basics, Constable Stephen Carroll was shot dead on the 9th of March, 2009. He was 48 years old. At the time of his death, he was responding to a 999 call about a broken window on a housing estate in Craigavon, Northern Ireland. The following day, on the 10th of March, 2009, a local newspaper was contacted and a representative purporting to be from the Continuity IRA took responsibility for the killing. Brendan McConville was arrested on the 10th of March, 2009, and he has been in prison ever since. <clears throat> Just two things to note about these initial facts. Firstly, by the 10th of March, 2009, it would have been a working assumption from the police service of Northern Ireland's perspective that this was an incident of dissident Republican activity. It was organized and they knew by the 10th of March that the weapon involved would have been very difficult for anyone to obtain without the kind of connections that the continuity IRA maintained. That's perhaps why we move on to the second point related to these facts, that all the key players in this case were arrested very, very quickly. You'll note that Brenda McConville was arrested within around 24 hours of the shooting having occurred. He was not the only person arrested on the 10th of March. It appears that a group of individuals, all of whom were allegedly collect connected to dissident Republican activity in the area, were arrested at roughly the same time. Now, what we are trying to figure out is whether this group of arrests occurred as a result of information that the defense did not have access to, or whether they were merely arrested because of their historic connections to dissident republicanism. But the key thing to note for now is just how quickly this investigation was able to move from the shooting on the 9th of March, the evening of the 9th of March, to arrests on the 10th of March. This is Lismore Manor, the housing estate where PC Stephen Carroll was shot. Lismore Manor sits in an area called Craigavon, County Amar. Craigavon is an area between two other towns of Lurgan and Portadown. This road here that leads onto Lismore Manor is called the Brownlow Road. And the Brownlow Road takes uh, you away from Lismore Manor and towards a motorway which would lead in both directions to Lurgan and Porter Down. The housing estate cascades back in rows like this, uh, and a road bisects the two sides of the estate, turning left and right here. You'll see at the back of the estate, and we're going to come up to take a take to look at this in a moment, but there is a lip of land at the rear of the estate, which will be very important when it comes to consider some of the evidence. Lismore Manor is a relatively new housing development. It was largely or significantly unfinished at the time of the shooting in 2009, and some of the witness statements from the officers initially attending the scene describe how there were sheets of corrugated iron effectively discarded after the construction of some of the properties. So it's a relatively new housing estate, but importantly, and we'll come to look on this in more detail in a moment, it was situated in among other housing estates, where all of which have an important evidential connection to the case. So this is the end of Lismore Manor, 
it's roughly at the end of the road that leads out towards the Brownlow Road. And this is a closer shot of the lip of grass at the rear of the estate. And what we have here are lampposts peppered across a path that runs all the way along the rear of Lismore Manor here. So this lamppost is situated on a path which, which runs all the way along the rear of the estate. And in between that path and the houses is a small area of effectively derelict land, unused land that separates this pathway from the housing estate. Now, these photographs are relatively new. They're taken from Google Earth, but we're now going to look at Lismore Manor as it looked in um, 2010, shortly after this shooting occurred. So this is effectively the same shot as we just saw, but taken 10 years ago in 2009, 2010. Here we have that same lip of land. And if you look closely, you can see the lampposts that dot the path um, that, lead, that leads around the back of Lismore Manor. And here we have that same lip of ground, the lamppost sticking up here, you can see, but significantly, we have this building here, which is number the rear of number 33 Lismore Manor. And this is the building through which the brick, well, through the window of which the brick was thrown, which triggers the call to Stephen Carroll or to the police service of Northern Ireland, and which brings Stephen Carroll to the scene. Here we have a closer shot of that path at the rear of Lismore Manor and a closer shot of the lamppost, which we saw from a distance earlier on. And as we are closer up, we can see that the lamppost has been adorned with the Irish flag. This being a typical symptom of Irish Republican sympathies in the area given that Irish Republicans believe that um, Ireland, the south of Ireland should be reunited uh, with the north and that the north of Ireland is effectively part of Ireland rather than part of the United Kingdom. I mention these lampposts because they came up in the course of the interviews with Brendan McConville. He is asked about these lampposts and asked whether they were um, painted effectively by people he knew. It was just reinforcing the point that the police immediately thought that this was the activity of Irish Republicans. The reason why this lamppost is significant, or perhaps more significant than any other lamppost, is because of the geography of this incident. Lismore Manor sits, this is obviously an aerial shot taken from Google Earth, Lismore Manor sits directly next to another housing estate called Drumbeg. Drumbeg is a predominantly Catholic housing estate. It is a housing estate which was known by the local officers as being connected to, or its residents being connected to, dissident Republican activity. And we'll come on to talk in a later video about some of the sectarian violence that had affected Drumbeg in the recent past. For now, you should note that the pathway at the rear of Lismore Manor connects Lismore Manor with Drumbeg. If you see, this pathway here links the rear of Lismore Manor and the lip of land at the rear of Lismore Manor with Drumbeg. And Drumbeg is a very significant estate also for evidential purposes in our case, because a number of the important addresses which later came to be connected to this incident were situated in Drumbeg. So just note for now the proximity of Lismore Manor with a predominantly Catholic housing estate, which was known at least as far as the PSNI was concerned with dissident Republican activity. So now we're going to consider some of the first witnesses who were deployed in the course of these proceedings. 
These witnesses were what we call agreed witnesses. There was nothing contentious about the evidence that they gave. And indeed, we can accept broadly what they assert about the case to be true. This witness is called, I've changed the names, but I've called him Kevin. And he gives his witness statement on the 21st of May, 2010. He says, I left my mother's house to go to my then girlfriend's house. She lived at number 33 Lismore Manor. At 8.39, I received a phone call. I walked from the living room into the kitchen to take the call. I switched on the light and sat down on the chair. I heard something smashing the kitchen window. I immediately looked up and saw a brick coming through the vertical blind towards me. I shouted to my girlfriend about what had happened and told her to ring the police. She had her mobile and rang 999. We all stayed upstairs after this for over an hour. I then heard two loud bangs from around the front of the house. I peeped through the blinds. I could see at least four or five police cars and an ambulance. At no time did I see any gunmen. So Kevin gives us an insight into the triggering incident which brings the police to the scene. He tells us that the brick was thrown through a window at the front of the house. And he gives us a rough timing for when that brick was thrown. Of course, the police had other ways of timing when that brick came through the window, precisely because Kevin tells us that immediately after shouting up to his girlfriend, she rang 999, and the police would obviously be able to time the moment when the call was made. So we know that the brick was thrown at around 20 to 9 on the evening of the 9th of March. Another significant thing about Kevin's witness statement is that he indicates that he remained upstairs for over an hour after the brick was thrown. You might think it's significant that he did not go and investigate the throwing himself. This suggests to me that on this particular housing estate in Northern Ireland, a brick coming through your window may be more serious in its connotations than it would be elsewhere. The second witness I'd like to look at is called, who I have called Jason. He gives his witness statement at around the same time as who I'm calling Kevin on the 21st of May, 2010. Jason says he left his home at about 6 p.m. He walked along a footpath that leads from Meadowbrook to Lismore Manor via Drumbeg. It was still light. Pausing there for a moment, he is talking about, I think, the footpath that we considered earlier. Meadowbrook is a housing estate just further along from Lismore Manor, sorry, and Drumbeg. And if you see, he indicates that he left his home at 1800 at 6 p.m. He then says, I arrived at Lismore Manor, the home of a friend, at about 1805. So we know that from Meadowbrook, Meadowbrook excuse me, to Lismore Manor via Drumbeg can be walked in five minutes. It's an indication of just how proximate these locations are, because that path is able to take him from Meadowbrook to Lismore Manor, walking via Drumbeg. Within about 10 minutes of my arrival, Kevin arrived. Kevin had been there before I arrived, but had gone to a local shop. I remember my friend had gone, got her children into their pajamas. I think it was around half past eight or nine o'clock when Kevin's mobile rang. That roughly correlates with what Kevin says as he puts the phone call at about 20 minutes to nine. He immediately got up and went into the kitchen. I cannot recall if he closed the kitchen door. Not long after Kevin went into the kitchen, I heard a sound like a window smashing. I jumped up from my seat and made for the living room door. Kevin ran in from the kitchen, saying the window had been broken. Kevin shouted up to my friend to call the police, and she called them on her mobile phone. So the witness I'm calling Jason does not add an awful lot to what Kevin has said about the incident, but the reason I mention it is just to give a sense of how close Lismore Manor and Drumbeg were, and the fact that the distance can be walked 
in what would be less than five minutes. He also corroborates roughly what Kevin says about the timing of the brick coming through the window. But as I've said previously, if we accept what Kevin says, then we can time the throwing of the brick by reference to the call to 999 and thereby by re police records rather than Kevin's evidence. So we're now going to look at some of the first responders to the incident at Lismore Manor. Initially, this amounted to police officers, but then shortly afterwards, paramedics arrived at the scene. Now, I've redacted all names, even though many of these names are mentioned in the course of the judgment. And I've also, for obvious reasons, not, including, not included the more explicitly upsetting material related to what was found when the first responders arrived. But what I did want to mention is the atmosphere that had arisen at Lismore Manor in the moments after this shooting occurred. This is a paramedic describing their journey to Lismore Manor sh shortly after receiving the call to attend. As we were making our way towards Lurgan, we heard the sirens in the distance and were overtaken by an unmarked police car. This was possibly at the third roundabout from Craigavon Area Hospital heading towards Lurgan. 20 to 30 seconds later, which was around 9.45 p.m., we received an emergency call to Lismore Manor, Craigavon. The details of the call on our vehicle screen stated only shooting. We put our blue lights and sirens on and made our way towards the incident. A few seconds later, ambulance control contacted us by radio and I believed at this time they informed us that it was a police officer who had been shot and that the police service of Northern Ireland were already on the scene. As we approached Lismore Manor, there was an unmarked police car blocking the entrance to the street. This was approximately 9.50 p.m. The police car moved to allow us access and we progressed down the street. I could see several armed police officers. There may have been up to nine or 10 police officers, but it was hard to tell. The officers were shouting and motioning towards a right-hand turn in the development. I parked our vehicle a short distance from the turn and could see an ambulance rapid response vehicle, RRV, call sign Romeo 13. This vehicle was parked adjacent to what looked like a silver car. The scene was quite hectic and Glenn said to me, be careful here. Because of the manner in which the officers were acting, I believe that the gunman may still have been at the scene. We took our equipment from our vehicle and were met by a police officer who directed us to a silver car, which was parked on the left-hand side of the street. Now you'll see that I've uh, included the name Glenn, but given that his surname is not included there, um, I thought it a rel relatively innocent inclusion. But in any event, the point of this witness statement is to make clear that when the paramedics arrived, they really faced what looked like a war zone. Nine or 10 police officers completely uncertain as to what had occurred and facing what they thought may still have been an active shooter. It really is testament to the bravery of the paramedics who arrive in response to this and of course, the bravery of the responding police officers, that they arrived in an area knowing that their colleague had been shot and not knowing precisely where he had been shot from or whether the shooter was intending to shoot anyone else. Some of the police witness statements indicated that one of their preliminary concerns was that the housing estate was surrounded by what they call high ground. Now, that high ground was precisely the area of lipped grass that we considered in the first shots in this video. It was clear that on arriving at the incident, 
the police were acutely aware that they were, in their own words, surrounded by high ground. Accordingly, when they arrived, they considered themselves to be extremely vulnerable. And it's perhaps not surprising that they flooded the area with officers as quickly as possible and in, in an attempt to secure the scene. In the next video, we're going to consider some of the initial evidential seizures from the scene and what those initial evidential seizures told the police about where the, where the shooter was situated. We're then going to consider some of the more detailed scientific evidence that began to emerge in the days and weeks after the 9th of March 2009. Thank you very much.